Good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight for this episode of Physicians on Call, uh, part of Hippocrates Docs and the Just One Thing for Health Initiative. Tonight, we have Dr. Pam Popper, the founder and CEO, president of the Wellness Forum in Columbus, Ohio. She has a topic that's a very hot topic now about the gut microbiome. So uh, Dr. Popper's video came out Saturday. I hope you got a chance to watch that. And uh, Dr. Popper, please tell us about yourself and how you came about choosing this topic. Okay. Well, I've been in the um, healthcare business for, I guess, 24 years. That sounds like an awful long time now. But uh, I developed an interest in nutrition quite by accident. Um, I was a person who never really cared so much about it and didn't take care of myself. I think everybody listening to this probably knows a lot of people like how I used to be, and you probably were this way one time too, but fortunately made some changes before, um, became aware that I should make some changes before something terrible happened and uh, became so interested in the topic of nutrition that I just decided to... Um, go into the healthcare field. And I think um, you hear this often too, when people learn about the right ideas about nutrition, I think we all say to ourselves, gosh, why doesn't everybody know about this? And maybe I should help tell them. That was really what got me into the healthcare business. So I started my company in 1996 and uh, we specialize in informed medical decision making where we we have the largest libraries in the world of, of materials that help people make good decisions about health. And often when they look at our libraries of materials, they become very, very interested in changing their diet and lifestyle habits because um, a lot of what we do in medicine is not really very effective. You can become pretty motivated by just taking a look at efficacy rates for drugs and procedures and things of that nature. So we offer diet and lifestyle training. Then we also uh, have a professional training program to uh, teach healthcare professionals of all types how to, how to do this and incorporate these ideas into their practice. So that's basically what I'm all about. I've appeared in a few films and written a couple books and um, try to do everything I can to get the word out. And that's one of the reasons I'm spending part of this evening with you. Thank you very much. We're so glad you're here. I got certified in your food over medicine course uh, back in, I think it was 2015. And yeah, I, you were one of the first that, that oh. did it. That book came out and I think it came out in 2014 and we introduced the course in 2015. Well, I'm glad to know that. At the time, I didn't know that, but it was, uh, it's a great course and that's a great book. So Thank you. People will take the time to pick that one up and, uh, and look through that because um, it's a great way to get the conversation started. So you capitalize really on spreading this message, which is exactly what we want to do. And this topic of um, gut microbiome is kind of a hot topic right now. So how did you decide to choose this as a topic and make this your challenge for the week? Well, um, what's happened is in the last probably 15 or 16 years, most of what's been written about the microbiome has been written in that period of time. I mean, we've known that humans have a microbiome since over 100 years. And Eli Metchnikoff won the Nobel Prize back in the early 1900s for his work and discovering some things about the microbiome. But um, for most of us, there was very little attention paid to um, the microbiome and healthcare training, and then all of a sudden, an enormous amount of research started uh, surfacing. And what this research shows us is that there isn't a health condition uh, or, or uh, either illness or wellness in the body that isn't related in some way to the gut microbiome. And, uh, and this includes things that you might not think of. I mean, a person's psychological state has, is, is based in part on the health of that microbiome. So it's becoming increasingly important. And, um, and so we're all talking about it. I mean, I went back and redid all my slide sets for all the disease modules I teach. And if we're teaching heart disease, there's a relationship to the microbiome. You have, you have a stroke and, and the condition of your microbiome to a certain extent will influence how quickly you recover. Uh, probiotics may accelerate the process. So, so it's important. It's one of those things that everybody should pay attention to and uh, everybody can pay attention to because now there's so many great products on the market and um, it does make a profound difference in one's health. So that's why I chose it. And I think more people should talk about it and often it isn't talked about in situations like this. I always like to be the outlier and choose something everybody else may not be, be bringing up for discussion. 
I agree. That's a great reason to uh, bring it up. Um, and you're, I, I've never heard of it uh, in a doctor's uh, office or in, a, in an official setting like that. And um, I think it's fascinating that we know so much, but it was not really being talked about. So in your opinion, and with the science that you have um, researched in this area, what are some of the things that we do that harm our gut microbiome? Well, my gosh, there's such a long list now. It actually starts with the way children are born. We have the highest cesarean birth rate in the world, in the westernized world here in the United States. And some of it is necessary. I mean, cesarean births save babies' lives, save mothers' lives. There's a certain amount of it you're always going to have going on, but, but we do too much of it. And um, the reason this is important is that one of the very important ways a baby's gut gets colonized with bacteria is traveling through the birth canal. And the, in fact, the bacterial colonies in the birth canal start increasing in anticipation of birth. So um, the number of cesarean births that we're seeing right now is part of the problem. Um, another problem is formula feeding, which doesn't seed the, the bacterial colonies the way that breastfeeding does. Uh, the next thing that happens is um, we are prescribing, and nobody would disagree with this, way too many antibiotics right now for things that antibiotics can't really even be effective for. I mean, most sinus infections are fungal, and yet the most common prescription issued for a sinus infection is, is an antibiotic. So we prescribe way too many antibiotics, and, and um, broad-spectrum antibiotics wipe out all bacteria. Uh, so that's an issue. I mean, the average child's taken 17 uh, uh, prescriptions of antibiotics by the age of 20. That's a lot, you know. We're consuming antibiotics in the food that we're eating, in animal food. We eat a lot of animal food, and this is where it really gets interesting. Um, your beneficial bacteria really like carbohydrate and fiber, and your pathogenic bacteria really prefer animal protein, fat, and processed foods, well, take a look around and what are people eating most of. So that's a problem. We're preferentially feeding the bad guys, not the good guys. Um, we, I, I think another issue is some other prescription drugs that are known to damage the microbiome, uh, oral contraceptives, NSAIDs, which are increasingly used all the time. So it's kind of a wonder that anybody survives till they're 30 years old and has any bacteria down there at all. And so uh, those are some of the things that we do that destroy the microbiome. And at some point in time, there's some really good reasons to fix it because those little critters down there do a lot of things for us if you take good care of them. So how do you know that there's a problem? What, what are symptoms that people might have after they've gone through these, uh, you know, overuse of antibiotics and, and other things that are, that are harming our gut microbiome? Microbiome. Sometimes, sometimes it's real overt, um, like people will develop inflammatory bowel disease, or they develop reflux, or they have diarrhea, gas, bloating, um, they don't digest their food very well, they're not absorbing nutrients from food, um, that sort of thing. So sometimes the, the symptoms are obvious. Sometimes you really don't know um, until something catastrophic happens. So for example, um, the gut bacteria operate your immune system using a feedback loop that's kind of like the furnace in your house where you set the temperature at 70 degrees and the um, you know it drops down to 68 and the furnace kicks on and when it gets back up to 70 the furnace kicks back off and so your your gut bacteria are operating your immune system in that way and uh, if they're not there your immune system may not know how to switch itself on or off in other words people who get sick all the time um, in some ways, cancer would be a profound failure of the immune system and the body's surveillance system. Um, in other cases, the immune, the immune system doesn't know how to switch itself off. Um, allergies, uh, an overreactive immune system is indicated by allergies. Autoimmune disease, where the immune system doesn't know how to behave itself and it starts uh, actually attacking tissues in the body. So these would be some signs that uh, you probably ought to be paying attention to that microbiome and doing something about it. So, so the ways to heal it, I mean, we all agree, everybody, at least I see uh, the names up on this call would agree that the whole food plant-based diet, which is healing so many of our other problems, that is one of the keys to getting your microbiome um, back into good shape. But can you talk about how it really, what is the best way to rebuild your system? Well, sometimes it's taking probiotics. Um, and, and one of the things that's confusing about this is 
we talk in, a lot when we're talking about eating the right diet, about the body's capacity to heal itself. And we all know people who've done that, people who had an autoimmune disease and they, they um, changed their diet and it got better, or they um, even cancer in some cases. People, we, there are tons of cases of cancer where people change their diet and the cancer goes away. Well, that's the body's self-healing capacity. The reason why that doesn't work so well when you're talking about your microbiome is because these critters aren't part of your body. They're renting space from you. I mean, here's the agreement we have. You get to live in my body. I won't charge you rent. You get to see the world on me and I'll take care of the food. And then in return, you're going to perform all these great services for me, like taking care of my immune system, absorbing nutrients from food, keeping things out of the bloodstream. Okay, so so that's the arrangement. But, you know, like like other types of tenants, if you abuse the tenants in your apartment building and they move out, well, you're going to have to find some more tenants, right? So it's the same thing here. If you've damaged your gut microbiome, um, you don't have the capacity to heal this colony because, or to replace it on your own because they aren't you. Uh, they are renting space, literally. It's, a, it's an arrangement we call commensal. So probiotics sometimes are necessary, but having said that, a lot of people make the mistake of thinking, oh, well, you know, I, I eat a lot of animal foods and a lot of toaster pastries and crap I'm not supposed to have, and yeah, I take a lot of prescription drugs, so I'll just take a probiotic and all will be well. Well, you have to change your habits too because you'll end up right back in the same position again if you continue to preferentially feed the pathogens. And, and I'll tell you how smart these critters are. And I, I've never, I mean, it never ceases to amaze me when I am doing research in this area. They're so smart that if, they, if, if you're really preferentially feeding the pathogens, the pathogens will reach across the aisle and say to the good guys, look, I don't know if you've realized it, but we're living off the fat of the land literally here. So all you have to do is a little genetic change, and you can switch teams and come over and join us, and you can be fat and happy too. And the and the good guys, you know, jump ship and switch teams, and there you have it. So so the taking of probiotics only works if you're committed to changing your habits and and uh, taking care of those bacteria. So that means converting to a plant-based diet. And um, we have a lot of good research showing that within a very short period of time, um, eating a plant-based diet makes a huge difference. Your beneficial bacteria start to say, hmm, looks like we're going to be well fed, time to go back to work, we'll, we'll make the colonies grow, and, and, and things start to get back to normal. Uh, so that's the best way to fix it and then become much more judicious in terms of taking drugs. I mean, we could almost do a whole separate um, uh, talk about that, but I, I, I think everybody in healthcare right now is really concerned about the cavalier way in which people take drugs. And, and I mentioned NSAIDs. They're advertised on TV like you take them every day when you have knee pain. You don't need to lose weight or take care of the knee pain, just take drugs. Well, that's a terrible plan for a variety of reasons, including the fact that your gut bacteria you don't like those drugs so much. So, uh, you know, the future judicious decision making on the taking of drugs would be a good way to protect your, your microbiome too. Right. So few people really know that. Uh, what's the best way to get these probiotics? Do you think that um, there are great benefits to things like kombucha and fermented foods, or do you think, you know, capsule? Um, high quality probiotics are a good way to go. I mean, if someone is observing a, a great diet, which is paramount, we know that, what, what, how would you recommend that they get the probiotics? Well, kombucha and fermented foods are not a substitute for probiotics. And um, so they're, they're great if people like them. And I'm, I'm always clear about this, too, because I can sometimes picture what some people might be saying as they're listening to this, you know, um, kombucha, fermented foods. Gosh, I hate that. So I always want to tell people there are no magical foods. I mean, you got to get the pattern right. So, um, But you could live for the whole rest of your life and never have a fermented food and you'd be just fine. So choose foods that you like you know, according to an eating scheme that's plant-based. But um, So if you really do need to replace the bacteria, you would take the, the probiotics either in a pill or as the dosages increase. Like when we give people medical food, they, it won't fit in a capsule, so they mix it with water or smoothie or something of that nature um, and, and try to buy them from uh, a place that's reputable and, and turns their product uh, frequently and hopefully somebody who knows something about the various types because there must be there are thousands of products on the market right now so there are knowledgeable people out there who can help you with this um, so that you get a good product and the right product to start with and, and that sort of thing. 
So sometimes I've noticed even on some probiotics that I've seen, um, some of them are actually obtained from animal sources. So, how, you know, I guess it's, I'm a good label reader, but maybe not everyone is. So can you offer some advice on how you would, you know, be able to, you know, be sure that what you're getting isn't? Uh, yeah, the read the, you should read the labels on everything. I, mean, I think that's a good habit to get into no matter what you're buying because um, we, I mean, you've been at this for a long time and I know you really are a diligent label reader, but a lot of people think that they're paying attention, but they're really looking too much at the nutrition facts label, not necessarily reading every one of those little ingredients. It's amazing what you find when you start doing that, right? So, so do read the label. Another thing to, to take into consideration when you're buying probiotics is the fact that um, the, uh, time is the enemy. They degrade over time. So I'm not so geeked up about refrigeration and all that sort of thing as I am, but if it's been sitting around for a long time, it probably, uh, the potency has probably diminished quite a bit. So high volume stores are good places to get these things. They're private practices where they really limit how much they have on hand. We do that in our office. We don't keep very much of it around. We turn them every three or four days. So that's about as fresh as you can get them. And, um, and there's not much time lag between when they leave the factory and somebody starts putting them in their mouth. So what do you, what do you have? Are they capsule form probiotics? We have, them, we have them in capsules. We have them in gummies. We have them in powder form. Uh, it just depends on the person and the dosage and, and that kind of thing. Do you, um, but do you have oh, yeah. to test people to find out? No, we, we use their history. In oh. other words, um, what, what, one thing you do have to be a little bit careful of, I, I work a lot with, uh, with people who have inflammatory bowel disease. And so for a person who, who has a very tender gut like that, uh, you'd actually want to fix that gut up a little bit before you start, uh, before you start taking a probiotic. And, and one of the reasons is, first of all, you don't want to waste your money. Um, you know, the, you, you swallow those bacteria, they go down, they took a, take a look around and say, not hanging out here. <laughs> we'll just keep going, you know, because of the, the, the terrain. So um, the timing of them is sometimes an issue and, and uh, making sure that you don't give uh, people real high doses to start with. Uh, they, can, they can sometimes make people a little bit upset in the tummy. Um, but there's not a lot of risk associated with them. You just get more benefit if you're dealing with somebody who knows what they're doing. Okay, so you 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 sounded a little bit like maybe fermented foods weren't something that you would recommend, but if oh no, they're they're wonderful. They're wonderful. Okay. I, I think the the point that I wanted to make is I don't like for people to think, and I, and I and I see this all the time that they have to eat certain foods. And I'll tell you how I learned it. I learned a lot of good lessons early when I started my business, and I'll never forget. I called this very nice lady who I was working with, and I said, uh, it was like a week or two after we had our meeting, and she was trying to lose weight and get her health back in order. And, and I said, well, how's it going? She goes, it's okay. I said, well, you know, you don't sound very happy about it. She says, I'm eating green apples, and I'm eating kale. I said, well, it doesn't sound like you like those foods. She goes, I don't. I said, well, then why are you eating them? She says, well, you know, I see those charts. Green apples are better for you than the other ones. And everybody thinks kale is so great. I said, listen, you got to stop choking down food you don't like because that's not a plan for sticking with this, right? And the, the way that you that you really get the benefit of changing your diet is if you do it in a way that you can stick with it for a long time. You don't get healthy by eating well for three weeks. You get healthy by eating well for 50 years. So I said, what kind of apples do you like? She goes, I like yellow apples. I said, well, my gosh, you got to go buy some yellow apples. And she goes, I said, what kind of greens do you like? She goes, well, I've always liked like that bib lettuce. I said, you got to start eating bib lettuce, right? So I think we have to give people permission to to eat things that they like. Um, and, and sometimes people uh, develop a taste for more ex exotic foods after they're at this for a while. I mean, I, I don't know that the first food I wanted to eat when I changed my diet was beets, but my gosh, I think I eat beets every week now. You know, so, um, so that's the only point I was making is I don't want people to, to think, oh, I got to start eating sauerkraut every day. I hate it, but I'll choke it down. That would be very counterproductive for what you and I want people to do. Well, I'm very glad you clarified that because I love sauerkraut. 
<laughs> I do too. Well, you know, and, and people do get more um, adventurous about food. And, and I made the mistake, and I think we've all done this. You know, we get to the place, we've been at this for two or three years, and then somebody says, oh, I made this great dish with red lentils and black quinoa. And we go, wow, I never had that. Let's, you know, and somebody else who's eating cheeseburgers and french fries says, I think I'll just jump off of the building if I have to eat red lentils and black quinoa, right? So, so um, but having said that, I'll share a story with you. Um, I had a prostate cancer patient uh, several years ago who said, I, I understand what you're talking about and I want to do it. He said, as you can see from my food journal, my problem is that um, I, I'm a pizza and like burgers and fries kind of guy. And, and that was kind of what was on his food journal. He says, well, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, you like bananas? He goes, yeah. I said, how about apples? Oh, yeah, I love those. Said, Potatoes, green beans, peas. Well, before we knew it, we had a list of like 20 foods. I said, well, I'll tell you what, how about you just eat those for now? He goes, seriously? I could eat like potatoes and green beans? I said, yeah, absolutely, eat those. Well, you know, he and his wife still come to yoga at our place. And, and um, for about the first six months, that was pretty much it. And then every once in a while, he'd pop his head in my office because my office is across from our yoga studio. He'd say, hey, you'll never guess what I did last night. I said, What's that? I had some quinoa. And he'd tell me about some, you know, exotica for him, right? And I said, well, how'd you like it? He goes, you know, it's pretty good. Came in one day. He said, you'll never guess what I'm doing now. I said, what's that? He goes, green smoothies. I said, really? Because this is a guy who, like, he was stretching to do oatmeal, right? So now he's having green smoothies in the morning. I said, how do you like it? He goes, shockingly good. <laughs> I <laughs> said, okay. So, again, if you just get people started and don't, um, and, and meet them where they are, and then it's astounding where they'll go with this if you just give them some time. Absolutely. Uh, good advice. You know, meet them where they are and then work from there. So um, can you completely rebuild the, the uh, gut microbiome for someone who has severely um, diminished their healthy bacteria? Yeah, um, I think there's evidence that you can. You can get stool samples and things of that nature that indicate that things are getting better. And certainly people see their symptoms get better over time. Um, it's not a perfect science. Um, and, and one of the reasons is some unanswered questions, for example, if you take some really great probiotics and you get your gut rebuilt and you stop taking them, how long does the rebuild last? I mean, we know that there's a lot of loss of bacterial diversity. Um, a colleague of mine, Martin Blazer, and his wife do a lot of research on the microbiome, and uh, she went to Venezuela and found a very remote tribe there and managed to get fecal samples and found 300 strains of bacteria um, that have disappeared from the gut microbiomes of most people in the United States. So there are some limitations that, and, and a lot we don't know because really it's only been 15 years of, of intense research, so lots to learn. Having said that, um, there's some amazing evidence. And, uh, and, and one thing I, I always tell people is that if you start reading medical journal articles about probiotics, um, you'll see studies that show no effect, studies that show some effect. Um, the fact that there are studies that show some or even really great effect is amazing because a lot of times in these studies, that's the only change people are making. In other words, they're not coming to somebody like you or me and learning how to eat a health-promoting diet. They're eating cheeseburgers and french fries and taking probiotics, and they still get some improvement, you know? So I think we have some pretty good evidence that it's definitely worthwhile to do. And, um, and our experience in the office has mirrored um, a lot of what we've read in journals uh, about the types of, of uh, improvements that you see. People have less diarrhea, less constipation, their guts aren't so inflamed, they start absorbing nutrients from food again, uh, lots of things that are measurable. Good. What is the effect of alcohol on the gut? And do you find that some people, maybe if they have an, a heavy intake of alcohol, uh, their gut microbiome also suffers quite a bit? Yeah, and that's just one thing that suffers when you drink a lot of alcohol. Um, it's unfortunate, but we have some very unscrupulous people who promote alcohol as a health food, and it's not. Um, and, it, and it does destroy your gut microbiome. In fact, um, uh, alcoholics are no, have notoriously poor gastrointestinal health. 
Um, one thing I'll mention about that, I'm, I'm certainly not recommending that people be teetotalers. I'm not. Having said that, alcohol is a treat. It's like chocolate and birthday cake. You know, you have it on very special occasions. And one of the reasons why the research has been so confusing to people is that a lot of the studies that have been done um, on the benefits of alcohol, if you could say that, have been done in comparing social drinkers with former drinkers. Well, why do people become former drinkers? Well, sometimes because they're really sick and sometimes because they have quite a drinking problem, right? So I think it was about 2014, a research group finally compared um, people who are social drinkers with people who are never drinkers. And boy, the benefit disappeared for every age group and, and demographic except for women my age who have an average of two drinks a month. Okay, and, and even then it was barely statistically significant. So again, this doesn't mean that wine or beer or alcohol or, or really anything else, birthday cake, chocolate chip cookies, it doesn't mean that you can't ever have those things, but um, we, some, we tend to confuse those things with food, you know what I mean? You want to drink water, not wine, you want to eat vegetables and beans, not um, toaster pastries <laughs> and, and um, you know, candy bars and that kind of stuff. So. It does make sense. So uh, does alcohol? I mean, uh, we talked about that. Does exercise have an effect? It life. does. Um, I, I don't know how much it affects the, the microbiome directly. I haven't seen a lot of science um, uh, on that, but it affects everything else so much that you just can't ignore it if you're going to talk about health. Uh, it's easier to stay lean. Um, we have some really good uh, evidence on exercise and mood. Um, exercise and um, more success overcoming addiction. And one of the reasons, by the way, why um, it, it's, I think there are a couple things actually with exercise and addiction. One is um, you're hanging out with a lot better people. You know, addicts need to find some new friends and runners are good people to hang out with or people at the gym and, you know, yoga class and Zumba. Those are much better friends to hang out with than uh, the folks you are drinking or smoking dope with or whatever. But um, the other thing is that, that all forms of exercise increase the production of something called brain-derived neurotropic, brain derived neurotropic factor, um, which literally rewires the brain and improves your cognition. So you can actually make yourself smarter with exercise. That's probably why so many of us in this group are smart, because we're, <laughs> we are so smart because we exercise, right? <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to think that. <laughs> <laughs> so do you, do you think that there's a certain group of uh, people who are more at risk? I mean, I know you talked about the birth, con the birth canal um, having been a C-section baby versus a natural born baby, that makes a difference. But do you think that any risks, any certain groups are more at risk, the elderly or newborn babies who have had a C-section birth or adults who have, um, it, we, we know the adults with bad habits, you know, probably suffer the most, but who's at risk the most? Um, I think that the people who are at risk the most are people who have genetic susceptibility uh, to um, to some type of illness. I'll, I'll use myself as an example. You know, every woman on my mother's side of um, the family has had rheumatoid arthritis by the time uh, they were 50. And um, I don't have it. I'm 62. And I think the reason I don't have it is because life and my good habits intervened uh, back when I was 38, uh, 37, 38 years old, and I changed my ways. So um, having said that, I'm genetically susceptible to developing a very severe and, and life-threatening autoimmune disease. So I'm a person who, without a gut microbiome and that's intact, might have some pretty devastating um, consequences from it. Um, I don't think it's good for anybody to have a destroyed microbiome, but for somebody like me, it might actually be a little bit more serious. So um, the genetically, the heavily genetically predisposed would be the folks who would, uh, uh, who would be harmed the most. Having said that, one thing about genetics, I really don't like for people to be feel like helpless victims. And, and we know that, uh, that, that really habits override genetics. Um, so you, you start out, you may start out with a bad hand, but you can, you, you can override that. You could start out being genetically gifted from a health perspective and, and ruin it by doing wrong things too. So 
Uh, don't get carried away thinking that your genes are your destiny because they're not. Right. That also makes perfect sense. So what can the elderly do if they're in a facility that um, it creates their meal plan? I, I suppose that, you know, when you're talking about uh, supplementing with probiotics, there's, there's that, but what if they're not in the know? What if we have a particularly um, uh, close elderly friend? How can we help them? Well, um, I think the, the first thing is that it, it, I, I promote families taking care of families. You know what I mean? I, I think we have too many elderly people who are ending up being warehoused um, in facilities, and sometimes it can't be avoided. But boy, um, the, the, time to, uh, the time to keep your parents and grandparents out of those places is long before it's time to go in. So, you know, my, my father's 89 years old and he lives in his own house and he drives his own car and um, he's in great shape. He doesn't take any drugs. So he has a very high quality of life. And my sister and I look after him. Um, I mean, we, you know, we talk to him a lot and we do a lot of things with him and take him places and go out to dinner and go to the theater. And so he has a busy active life and he eats well. So he eats well, he's hydrated he has a busy mind. He's got stuff to think about all day, places to go. He helps out with the various family businesses and this kind of thing. And that, that's how an older person can live um, until they die in an independent state. So I, so I think, first of all, one message that we should all take from this is, you know, take care of yourself and you end up like my dad where your IQ is higher than your cholesterol without being medicated, right? So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is... Um, if you have somebody who is in a facility, uh, sometimes places are amenable to bringing food in, uh, to having special instructions for um, for a particular patient. So I, I wouldn't necessarily give up on the idea that things could be different. But boy, you just want to work hard to keep yourself and your family members out of those kinds of facilities. Right. I have a friend who's 88, and she's just a friend. She's not a family member. And uh, she just had a bad accident and she's in a rehab hospital. Hopefully not for good. You know, she's right. very pleased that at 88, she, her mind is still very sharp. And she has some, a very small family here that hopefully they'll take care of her. But they don't know what you know. They don't know what yeah. I know. So well, I was, it's a, a lot of it's just going back to our traditions, you know. And, and in other cultures, um, in, in most other cultures, actually, um, you know, there, there's quite a bit of focus on family members taking care of family members. And that's everything from, you know, babysitting your sister's kids because it's better for them to be with family than, you know, dropped off someplace else to um, making sure your parents are taken care of and, you know, the, everybody looks out for everybody. And, and I'd like to see more of that in communities. I know sometimes I talk about this, people look at me like, you must be like 300 years old the way you talk. And But, but I think we've gotten away from the things that are really important in life. Your health is important. It determines how long your life is going to be and what the quality of your life is going to be. I have a different perspective at my age. I think family is really important. I think community and friends are really important. Um, I work really, really hard, and I have a big, long list of things I want to accomplish, but um, you'd be probably shocked. Some of you know my work habits. You'd be shocked at some of the things I do for recreation and how much time I invest in those kinds of things now because it involves spending time with people I really care about. Um, and you might wonder, well, what does that have to do with, um, with diet and health and all that? Well, well, again, you know, older people left to their own devices, they become dehydrated, they don't eat enough food, they lose interest in life, they stop being socially engaged. And you know, so, you, so you just, you make them keep those connections with people and then the whole community gets better. You know, I, I really feel very strongly about that. Um, the fabric of our communities is disintegrating and it's affecting our health in really negative ways. Right. Well, they're blue zones um, uh, topics too, weren't they? You know, that yeah. very same thing. I'm I got I got a chance to see uh, Dan Buettner speak at a conference last summer. The guy who wrote the Blue Zones, and he's he's wonderful. I mean, he's really entertaining and that sort of thing. But but they're very community oriented. And one one story just goes to the fact, and and I think this is important for health too. I mean, I'm a hard scientist, and and I talk a lot about biochemistry and 
and um, and and I have to do that. When I present at scientific conferences, they don't want to hear what I'm telling you right now, but I'm going to tell you this because it's important. Um, he showed a, a picture of a group of Japanese women who are all between 100 and 110 years old, and they've known each other since they were born in the same community. They've all been friends since they were old enough to make friends. And the the way that Japanese women bond is when they're little kids, and, and men do this too, but particularly women, they, they make friends in the neighborhood, and then those are your friends for the rest of your life. You might make some new ones, but you don't lose those old ones. And um, and so they get together in the afternoon, and they drink a little sake, and they, they chat and gossip, and, and they take care of their great-great-great-great-great-great-grandchildren. He showed a picture of this one woman who's like 110, taking care of seven generations down a little baby. Now, can you imagine being 110 years old and you're in good enough shape that your great, 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 great granddaughter drops off the baby and says, I'll be back at four o'clock, right? And knows that great, 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 great grandmother can take care of it. So, so this is, this is important. These women are healthy because they eat well. They're healthy because they're physically active. They're healthy because they're socially engaged and they have purpose. And, um, and the family and community structure keeps them that way. So we could learn a lot from that. Um, we, we could learn an awful lot from that. Most definitely. Most definitely. I'll, I'll open up the floor. I don't mean to hog the, uh, the questions here, guys. Uh, Dr. Chawla, Dr. Grossman, Jane, Sarah, Lynn, I'll uh, be happy if you want to add, actually talk with Dr. Popper too. Everybody's being so quiet today. <laughs> Yeah, feel free. I'm happy to answer some more questions. No, I think it's a great, uh, you have a great presentation, and I, I agree with just about everything you say, especially the social aspect of it. I see it all the time. Yeah. Well, and you know that there's a, a, a colleague of mine wrote a great book um, a few years ago. We had her speak at one of our conferences. Her name's Kelly Turner, and the book was Radical Remission. And I learned a lot from this book. Um, and it, her, she was the first person who ever did a study of terminal cancer patients who survived. And she interviewed a thousand of them. And the purpose of the study was to determine how these people did it, because they fall off the radar screen. They don't go back to their oncologist often. And so anyway, the thing that was really interesting about these thousand people, they didn't know each other. And she was able to identify 75 different strategies they were using but a thousand people who didn't know each other all used the same nine. And the first one won't shock you. It was they, they adopted a plant-based diet of some type. Um, the second thing was that they took control of their health. Their doctors routinely described them as being annoying. So you kind of like to be annoying to your doctor. That means you're asking a lot of questions and you're checking things out for yourself. But then the other chapters in the book, the other things that they were doing was um, making sure that they had purpose in life good social connections, unresolved problems got solved. A lot of the cancer patients said, I think I got this cancer for a reason, and if I could figure out what it is, I probably could survive. And, um, and so it really amplified or brought, brought to my attention, and it was probably something I needed to pay more attention to, that we are more than just the cells in our body and the biochemical reactions that happen because of the food we eat, the water we drink, those are all really important things, but there's, there's a higher level of living that we need to be engaged in too. And people with life-threatening illnesses, their, so their survival depends upon getting back in touch with that to a certain extent. Yeah. Dr. Chawla, did you have a question as well? Uh, no, I pretty much, uh, I was going to ask about alcohol and a few other things that you already covered. So um, it was very informative. Thank you, Dr. Popper. You're welcome. Do you have favorite recipes and uh, websites that you like to advise your patients to um, check out when you're being especially careful with, you know, making a transition for them? toward a more healthy lifestyle? Yeah, I think there are a lot of them out there. The first thing that I always tell people, I mean, I like our cookbooks and, you know, one of my business partners wrote the Forks Ever Knives cookbook. And, you know, so we have a lot of resources at our place. But having said that, people don't think to do this, but if you have something that you really love, 
you know, I really love uh, this particular pasta dish or whatever, you can Google vegan version of, or even low fat vegan version of, and a recipe will come up, or 10,000 versions of a recipe will come up. And that's sometimes the place to start. Take something that you really like and turn it into a healthier dish. What, one tip that I give to people when they're making this transition um, is you, of course, want to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, and, and that, that's you know, very crucial and foundational. But, but if you think about it, most people are making um, at least a couple, three things for dinner on a regular basis that are already plant-based or close to it. So, all right, so we're going to keep those three. Now think of some things that you're making that um, could be made um, more plant-based. So maybe you make a really amazing chili and it's well-seasoned and all that sort of thing, and you're, you habitually put beef in it. Add a different kind of bean or some vegetables and carrots. Or just do something to replace the beef. And so come up with a couple, three recipes that, uh, that you do that with, and then get online and start looking for some things that look interesting to you. Or go to, a, go to Barnes & Noble and start looking at the vegetarian section of the cookbooks and just start looking for things that look interesting. Or to the library and pick out two or three things. Well, now we have nine dishes. And, you know, most, most people say, 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 oh, my gosh, I'm, I got to find 100 things to make. Most people don't make 100 things for dinner. They make about six or eight. So get yourself nine. That's a place to start. And then you can branch out from there. But there are marvelous cookbooks on the market. The, the, the Internet is full of resources for uh, recipes and cooking demos. And, I mean, you could get on the Internet and watch YouTube videos of plant-based cooking till the end of your days and not run out of things to look at. Oh, I definitely agree. Definitely. I find a lot of my recipes just by scrolling through Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Right. Yeah, some of my, my favorite things, I, I really like, um, uh, I'm kind of a simple girl with the food, but I really love sweet potatoes. And almost every weekend that I'm home, I'll bake up like 10 pounds of, of uh, maybe even 15 pounds of sliced potatoes. Um, and then just put them on the fridge and I can microwave them for lunch or dinner or whatever. Um, in the wintertime, I love soups uh, and, and simple soups. You know, we have a great brown rice vegetable uh, dried soup mix and I just uh, chop up baby bella mushrooms and big pile of kale and, you know, it becomes a great big pot of soup that, you know, I can, I can get like 10 bowls of soup out of it. Um, I like squash. I love butternut squash in the fall. And uh, butternut squash, brown rice, and cracked pepper on you know, ground pepper on top is one of my the dishes I love. Um, I do a lot of wraps and black bean soups and um, pasta dishes. Uh, one of my favorites is, again, Simple Girl Angel Hair Pasta with marinara sauce and about a half a pound of chopped steamed asparagus. And it's fabulous, you know, so doesn't have to be complicated. It just has to be well seasoned. That's true. It doesn't have to be complicated. Well, we do have some questions coming in, Dr. Popper. Sarah, Good. Yeah. Sarah asks, uh, what would you recommend to a hospital patient who's placed on a heavy duty antibiotic such as vancomycin? Other than switching to a plant-based diet, is there a probiotic that you would recommend? Yeah, I'd put, uh, uh, not knowing anything about the patient, I'd probably want to know more, but, but I would put that person on a very high dose of, of probiotic, and they should take, by the way, probiotics should always be taken with food, and not at the same time as the antibiotic is taken. Um, but um, you get, when, when, as soon as somebody starts taking an antibiotic, they should go on ahead and start taking a probiotic, just not at the same meal. Okay. All right, and Jean has a question for you, too. Are there other foods besides fermented foods like pickled beets and sauerkraut that might be helpful to build the microbiome? Such as plants, plants. Those little critters love carbohydrate and uh, and fiber. So the more fiber you eat, the better off you are. They really like that stuff, and they and they use fiber um, and carbohydrate to to produce all kinds of chemicals down there, like butyrate that that keeps the inflammation levels low and um, so they, they produce serotonin. Here's another kind of interesting thing is that food crossing, uh, rubbing up against these enterochromaffin cells in the gut, that's where your serotonin is produced. That's why people who, you'll often hear people who adopt a plant-based diet say, listen, I did this because I needed to lose weight and I wanted to get off my blood pressure medication. But I have to tell you, it seems like I 
you know, I feel a lot better mentally than I used to. And, and, and that's not, they're not making that up. That's a common observation. And we have a, bio, you know, we have a mechanism of action to explain it. It's, it's fascinating to me. It's just fascinating that they're connected in that way. And here are some more questions. Um, is the colon considered part of the microbiome since the colon <laughs> Is yeah, you've got a you've got a microbiome everywhere. In fact, there's a microbiome on your skin, which is why you don't want to use antibacterial soap unless you absolutely have to. There's a microbiome in your eyes, all through your gastrointestinal tract. In fact, there's a there's a mucosal um, coating that goes all through the 30 feet of GI tract, and each area. The, the mucosal coating is the, it's like a gel, and it has a different composition, and there are different bacteria that live there. So H. pylori lives in your stomach. You got a little E. coli and C. diff, but a lot of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, all kinds of strains like that as you get into the small intestine. So you have, you're, we're swimming in a sea of bacteria. And, and I don't know if you've know, known people in the past who are sort of germaphobes. Oh my gosh, I have to wash my hands. And, you know, if I touch a doorknob, people, people can barely be funny about this. Well, if you could just, you know, magnify everything around people, you would see that we're all sitting tonight in a soupy mess of bacteria and viruses and all kinds of things floating around in the air. So really good to focus on the internal terrain and <laughs> build that up. But, but we, we house, if you could take all the bacteria out of the inside of your body and put it on a plate, it's someplace between four and five pounds of the critters. Uh, it's amazing. I've heard the numbers before, 10, 10 million, 10... Uh, it's a hundred. It's about a hundred trillion, and uh, and the genetic diversity of the critters in your gut is actually much more uh, complex than I think. It's something like seven genes. They have seven genes for every one gene the human has. It's, it's mm -hmm. amazing. They're much more diverse than we are. It is. It is absolutely fascinating. So another question just came in: Can boosting the microbiome heal diverticulosis? It's part of it. Um, that's again where fiber uh, comes in handy because keeping things moving through the system is one of the ways to keep you keep you from getting um, gastrointestinal diseases. I've, I've written a lot about diverticulitis and diverticulosis, and one of the reasons is because most gastroenterologists do not follow the treatment guidelines from their own association. Um, so, for example, frequently antibiotics are prescribed, and, and the association's own guidelines don't call for that, and it's counterproductive, and then people are told to avoid strawberries and things with seeds, and that's not good advice, and uh, take antibiotics and have a colonoscopy. I mean, the, the whole protocol is just completely contrary to what the evidence shows. So, so um, eat a high-fiber diet, and, and you can't do much about those little pouches. They're not going to go away, but you can keep depositing food in them and keep them from getting infected by, by keeping things moving through the system. Okay. And what are your thoughts about eating a vegan keto diet and its impact on the microbiome? Um, devastating. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the keto diet. So there are a lot of misunderstandings about that. It's also something I've written about. So a ketogenic diet is, is a very, very high fat diet that was originally developed at Johns Hopkins University to uh, treat childhood epileptics. And the reason is that um, we've known for a long time that a person who has frequent seizures when they're fasting water fasting, the seizures generally either slow down or stop. Well, if you have a two-year-old or a three-year-old who's having 50 seizures a day, you can't, the, the child can't fast for two or three years, which is how long it, it would take to actually uh, treat the problem. So uh, you, you put the, the child in ketosis by feeding them a very high-fat diet. Now, the first thing is <clears throat> to do this right, you have to weigh and measure every single morsel of food that goes into the child's mouth. Um, so people come in my office all the time. They tell me they're eating keto. I tell them, no, you're not. You're just eating fat. I mean, you haven't been in ketosis for 13 seconds in the last five months looking at the way that you're eating. So, so it's very, very um, exactly calibrated. With, a, with, a, with an epileptic child, if the child picks up an oyster cracker off the floor and eats it, he'll have a seizure. So you know right away he's gone out of 
ketosis. But for people who are trying to stay in ketosis for other reasons, unless they're testing their ketone bodies all day long, they don't have any idea what they're doing. And they don't have a seizure or something like that that would show them they're out of ketosis. Um, so, so that's one use. And, and the vast majority of children who are able to do this for two or three years, uh, their seizures are reduced sharply, and, and, and in many cases, they just stop. Now, the child spends the rest of his life getting over the damage done by eating all that fat for just two or three years. Um, the other appropriate use for a ketogenic diet is there are certain types of very aggressive brain cancers. For example, I have a colleague at Boston University by the name of Tom Seyfried, and his research group has been working with terminal cancer patients who don't have time to eat their way out of a diet. Treatments don't work or eat their way out of cancer and the treatments don't work. And they've been able to keep uh, terminal patients alive six, seven years after they're supposed to be dead. Not a perfect science yet, but that's better than anybody else is doing. Again, the diet is horribly damaging, but you're a whole lot better off staying alive for six years and doing some damage to your body to stay alive than saying, I don't want to eat all that fat and being a dead person. The problem is that we have a lot of people who don't fit either of those categories who have decided that they're just going to eat a lot of fat. And they start doing that. They damage their gut microbiome. They damage their arteries because you know, all types of fat. We have the technology to take apart atherosclerotic plaque now. We know it contains monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, and saturated fat. So all that olive oil people are eating, and that's it's, it's all contributing to cardiovascular disease. So um, it's highly, highly, highly inadvisable for most people to eat a keto diet, vegan or otherwise. I wish everybody knew all that. <laughs> Well, that's why we're here. We're going to at least make sure this group knows all that, right? Spread it as best as we can. Okay, exactly. so uh, we have a couple more questions that just came in. Um, okay. Jean asks, uh, she says she has a friend who's on oral chemo, and she's having a lot of UTIs. Will probiotics help her prevent the UTIs? Possibly, yeah. Um, better food, too. Um, and, and there are all kinds of things that... Um, that you can do uh, to, to lower the nausea. Um, I'm, I'm reading a book right now called Choices in Healing. It was written in 1986 by Michael Lerner. And uh, there's another book that I read last year called Psychoneuroimmunology, which talked about the effect of, of, um, of many things on cancer patients. One thing is cancer patients often get nauseous and don't feel like eating, even when they smell, when they walk into the room where they get the chemo, and just the smell of the room can make them nauseous. So there are a lot of alternative treatments that can make it easier for cancer patients to eat well, stay hydrated, and of course take probiotics, and that makes it much less likely that they'll get sick. Thank you. Uh, Sarah says she enjoyed your book. Is there oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, is there anything that was edited out of the book that you wish? No, you mean when we were, when we were uh, writing it, it was a publisher? I would suppose that's what she means, yes. Yeah, well, I'll tell you an interesting thing about writing a book. So every time you write a book, it's sort of like having a baby. You say you're never going to do it again, but in two years you forget, and somebody calls you and says, hey, you want to be in my movie? You want to write a book based on my film? And you go, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And then about three months in, you're going, what happened to me? I swore I was never going to do this again. Well, the reason I tell you this is that when uh, my co-author and I turned that manuscript into Ben Bella books. We'd spent a lot of time on it. We thought it read pretty well. And there were 7,248 changes made to the book between then and when it actually hit Barnes and Noble. And some of them were punctuation and some of them were, you need a different reference and some of them were, we don't like this idea, replace it with something else. But they were right about a lot of things. They really did a good job with us. And um, I think that's one of the reasons that book has had such great traction. We converted it to an audio book um, uh, about a year and a half ago, and the audio book is doing well. And it's the type of book because it's a conversation that lends itself well to an audio book. So I think that was a really good decision, too. Excellent. Uh, talk a little bit about diet fiction. Uh, I I've listened to your Tuesday and Thursday video clips always. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think talk a little bit about it, but talk with our friends about it. Yeah, so Diet Fiction is my latest film, um, and it features, this film features a lot of our, a lot of Wellness Forum people. My dietitian, Julie Gardner, is in it. Uh, my business partner, psychiatrist, Peter Bregan, is in it. My good friend and business associate, uh, co-founder of Cochrane Collaboration, Peter Goetsch, is in it. 
and uh, Chef Del Shroff is in it. And it's the the book is or the book and the movie are about the diet industry and how how greedy people really capitalize on our obesity and, and weight problem and and uh, instead of helping to solve it are are creating more of a problem. I mean the amount of money that gets spent on diets and dieting and and it's miserably ineffective. You can just look around at the shopping mall and see that things aren't going so well. So um, it's a bit of an expose on that. Um, one of the things that I'm being careful to do with books based on films is to make sure that they're not just a transcript of the film, that there's a lot of information in the um, in the book that isn't in the film. And so in the book, um, there's a there's a, a, a section that talks about some of the crazy diets out there, like the, the, the wheat belly and grain brain and some of the just moronic stuff that's that's circulating out there and um, and a review of those things and so there's a and some of it's pretty funny I've had people say I kind of laughed out loud in certain sections so um, and it's also it's available in ebook and paperback both so um, we're, we're hearing good things it's the number one documentary um, in the country right now and uh, it has been in the top four off and on but it's number one right now doing really really well same distributor has picked it up that picked up uh, Food Choices, which just did great for us. Still doing great for us, actually. So where can we watch Diet Fiction? You said you can watch it on iTunes. Um, uh, you can watch it on uh, Google. Google has a platform. Um, I think Amazon has a platform. And then soon it'll go. It probably will go to Netflix at some point in time. But it's on a lot of the popular video platforms right now. Excellent. Okay. Uh, just a minute ago, you, you talked very briefly uh, about fasting with the epileptic children, but do you have um, a lot of uh, knowledge and, you know, a good scientific opinion on fasting in, in someone who's not epileptic? What are your yeah, I've sent, I've sent probably 500 people to fast at True North in the last few years. They keep threatening to name a building after me. <laughs> um, they haven't done that yet. And, and there are more fasting centers opening around the United States, which is important because True North is, is booked a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's one in Ohio now. There's one in um, Florida, one in Oregon, and uh, then True North in California, which is the biggest one, but a lot of these other people train there. Um, but fasting is it goes back to biblical times. I mean, it, it, we didn't know a lot about the science of it back then, but one of the things that brought it forward into modern times is um, a doctor in, I think it was Minneapolis, uh, was horribly sick. He had awful allergies and he had rheumatoid arthritis. And at the time, this was back in the 1800s, and it was thought that if a human didn't eat for seven days, he'd die. So he hatched this plan because he was so miserable, he was going to stop eating and kill himself. Well, he stopped eating, and instead of killing himself, after a week or so, he felt great. So he went to another physician friend. He said, you know, I was going to kill myself, but that, that didn't happen. Now I feel really good. I think I want to live. But if I'm going to continue to not eat, I think somebody should be looking in on me. And so that was actually the first supervised fast. Uh, but um, the, the people who are trained to do it are, are medically trained and they know how to monitor people so that they don't fast for too long and that sort of thing. But it's a, it's a marvelous practice. Um, it can be used for a variety of things ranging from spiritual enlightenment to uh, shrinking a tumor so that the margins are clear so that you can take it out. Um, it's not a cure for cancer, but it can be great as an adjuvant. So I'm a fan. I send a lot of people. I've never had anybody who was unhappy that I sent them to a fasting center. Uh, so I recommend it highly. Wonderful. Wonderful. So now another one of our listeners is asking, where can people find you and how can we follow you? All right. So um, uh, my website is wellnessforumhealth.com. I put out a newsletter on Monday. I put out video clips on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's free. You can get a free education a few minutes, three times a week. Uh, I cover a lot of content that other people aren't covering, ranging from some of the scandalous issues that are going on with drugs and the FDA and that sort of thing to dietary habits and um, and all that. So lots of great education that way. Um, 
we're the biggest company in the world that, that does this type of work, and we have huge libraries of information that you can subscribe to. Um, I have a, a great team of trained health professionals that are very skilled at helping people get out of the medical mill. That's what we call it, by the way. People get sucked into the medical mill. Lots and lots and lots of tests and treatments getting sicker instead of better. And that's not what healthcare is supposed to be all about. So we have some great folks that can work with you um, and, and help you get well. And then um, lots of films and books and all that good stuff. I know, you're a very busy lady, Dr. Pam Popper. Yeah, and I'll give my email, by the way. I almost forgot. Pam Popper at MSN.com. I do answer all my own emails within 24 to 36 hours, and uh, and we're open 12 hours a day. Our office number is 614-841-7700. Wonderful. Well, Lynn, would you like to uh, ask some more questions or wrap up with this fabulous call tonight? Well, I do have one question, and that okay. is, Really, and thank you, Lisa. That is really about our kids. Um, you know, with the way things are headed, there are more kids that are obese. The statistics are showing that um, kids will be dying before their parents. And do you find that there is one thing or a couple of things that parents and grandparents can do for their kids? I mean, there are more kids suffering with eczema and, you know, all of these things that, of course, uh, go back to diet. But what do you find and what do you recommend to parents to help them navigate kids into the right space? Because obviously they're not. Yeah, I think I think the first thing is that parents have got, have got to make a mental shift that they're going to pay attention to this and that it's important. And I'll tell you something, I had an epiphany one day when I was running. Actually, I have all my epiphanies when I'm running, so when my knees go out, we probably have to close the company. But in any case, I was thinking about, you know, I'm 62 years old, and um, at least my dad says this. He said, you know, after all, you about gave, gave us a heart attack when you were a kid, but you turned out pretty well. I, I actually did. And so I think back to what I was taught as a child. And, and I was taught a lot of really good things as a child. You know, do what you say, um, tell the truth, um, always do your best. And, you know, if it, I remember my mom saying things like, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing well, and get an education, and, you know, all that good stuff. So here's my point. Most of the, almost all the things that my family stressed, the good values my family stressed, took me a while, but, but I got to the place where I took those things seriously and I did it. But I don't recall a single discussion, not even five minutes, about diet and health when I was a kid. So it certainly isn't shocking that I woke up at the age of 38, overweight, eating cheese and more than doing cookies and, you know, not very healthy person, not exercising because it was never, it was not part of our family's value system. Hard work and all that was part of our family's uh, value system. So, so my point is, I think this starts with, with families saying, this is important. We're going to pay attention to it. And it, it requires effort. I think the second thing is that, you know, the announcement way of doing this where if you announce to the family, okay, you guys were eating healthy. I mean, there's nothing that will make kids want to run away from home more than hearing that. So, so you, you basically start by gradually changing the food in the house with a deadline in, in mind. So, you know, we're having this conversation on February 5th. So we're still, if the deadline's December 30th, we're probably taking way too long to make this transition, but we certainly don't have to do it by Friday. So you start making the transition and getting kids involved in growing food, making food. Kids love this stuff. I mean, one of, one of my coworkers, uh, who's a pharmacist, um, she has four kids and she, when they go to the farmer's market, she gives them each some money and says, look, you can't buy candy and that stuff, but, but any plant thing here you can buy. Well, guess what her kids want to eat when they get home? What they bought, you know, because they have ownership of it. So, so you get kids involved and you start making it part of your value system. You have conversation about it. Um, you, um, you expose kids to information. I mean, by the time a, a kid's 10 years old, he can watch Forks Over Knives. And, um, and what happens over time is kids pick up on this and you don't have to lecture them about it. There are some great programs out there uh, that we use to teach picky eaters how to, how to, uh, 
how to become not picky eaters. It works like a charm, and we work with parents to do that. Um, but I think it's like anything else. You, you have to pay attention to it, and it requires constant effort, not in a lecturing, threatening way, but in a – our family is into health and fitness. We eat good food. We go to the park. We exercise. We ride bikes. Um, we drink clean water. We have treats on birthdays and holidays. Cake is not in the house all the time, you know, those kinds of things. And uh, so you set the foundation for kids to learn what health is all about and, um, and to want to, to seek health. And, and I see it working. You know, we have, we've worked, we've been at this long enough that we've seen kids grow up in, in this. And, and, um, and, and they, it's not that they don't ever eat bad things and they explore on their own and that sort of thing. But they, they, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And just like every other value that you instill in a child, um, telling the truth, don't steal, all that kind of stuff and get an education, do your best. These types of things that you learn about health and food, um, they, they come back around. Uh, so, so you just have to start paying attention to it. And I think part of the, you know, we have, we have an issue with, with the way kids are raised these days because it used to be that there was no such thing as kid food. There was just food. And in fact, in most places in the world, there's no kid food. There's just food. And somehow a couple of generations ago, we started having kid food. There's a kid section on the menu and it's full of crap in every restaurant. Um, we all know, right, that kids want macaroni and cheese. They won't eat rice and beans, and they want cheeseburgers. They don't want to eat veggie lasagna. Well, we got to get away from this idea of kid food and start teaching children to eat food. I mean, their future depends on it. Their health depends on it. And uh, one last thing I'll mention, and I think it goes to the adult mindset as you get ready to start down this path, is I, I get this distinct impression from a lot of people that they think that, um, eating a health-promoting diet is punishment for having gained weight or gotten sick, and it's not. Eating a health-promoting diet is like the best gift you have ever been given. It's your ticket to living a long, wonderful life. It's the best chance you have of doing it. It's not punishment. It's a gift, and most people in our country don't really have this gift, so don't squander it, you know, and certainly pass it on to your children wonderfully said definitely thank you so much for that wow you're welcome wow and dr popper thank you so much for spending the evening with us today we really well, you're 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 welcome next time i'll do it video but see the the secret that i'll share with everybody is we have a hot yoga studio in our building and sometimes i teach hot yoga and when I come out of hot yoga, it's 105 degrees and 40% humidity in there. I'm not presentable on a camera. So next time we'll plan this so that I'm presentable and you won't have to use my picture. You can actually use my face. All right. Fabulous. We look forward to that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Excellent job as usual. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, Dr. Grossman, Dr. Chala and all of our guests thank you so much for being with us this evening dr popper if there was one other thing that you would like to share with our guests with our audience tonight what might that be um i'm trying to think of what what uh what would encapsulate all of this i i think you know i think that um not to not to sound so philosophical but but I, I'm interested in using methods to solve problems that have, you know, huge breadth. You know what I mean? I, I want to make a big difference. I guess when you get to be my age, you think, well, I've got maybe 40 more years to, to work, maybe longer. You know, they found a guy in Chile who's 137 years old, and I'm hoping that they can, he says so, and if they can verify it, then I got 75 years to live, to live in. That, that would be fabulous. But, but, but thinking in, in terms of, it's probably realistic for me to work for another 30-some years. And so I'm looking to do things that make the biggest difference. So you think about um, helping people get out of the medical mill, enhancing their quality of life, all those things are important. But, but if you look at the nutritional part of what we do, helping people adopt a plant-based diet. Boy, it's good for their bodies, right? It's good for the animals because, my gosh, what we're doing to animals is just horrific. It's good for the planet because the animal, these horrible livestock farms contribute 
uh, more to greenhouse gases than cars. If everybody stopped driving, it wouldn't have as big an impact as if everybody stopped eating so much animal food, you know? And so when you stop and think about it, there are very few things that we can do in life that have such a huge impact. And I think, I think everybody wants to be part of something really big. You know, you'd like to do your own little part to join in a movement that could really be a game changer. And I think this is it. You know, we get enough people on board doing this. We can clean up the planet, be kind to the animals, be kind to our bodies and to ourselves and really change our culture in profound ways. Beautiful. Thank you. I think that that is a wonderful mandate to put out to everyone. That's a part of what it is that we're doing and what it is that we're bringing to share with everyone. Um, and what a great note to end the, the uh, call tonight. Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Popper. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Dr. Popper. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everyone. We will see you back here again next week when we have another fabulous doctor sharing with you. And we invite you to join us again. Bring a friend. Thanks again. We will see you soon. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.